Hi, it's Miss Kyoto, ready for our shared reading. We continue to learn about the different biomes, the different environments that we have on Earth. Remember, plants and animals that live in one environment might not be able to survive in another. Today, we're going to learn about plants and animals that live in a forest. This book is called Ancient Ones, The World of the Old Growth Douglas Fir. It's written by Barbara Bash. Walking into an old growth forest, you enter a strangely silent world. The earth feels moist and springy underfoot, and the air is thick with the fragrance of decomposing needles. Lichen-covered logs crisscross the forest floor, and moss clings to the towering trunks. At first, it all seems too quiet and still, but after a while, you start to relax and begin to really look and listen. High overhead, in the canopy of branches, a bird warbles softly. Out of the corner of your eye, you see a seed, or is it a pine needle, drift lazily to the cushioned floor. This is the world of the ancient ones, silent, enormous, and full of secrets. The old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest extend along the coast from Northern California to Southeastern Alaska. Many different trees inhabit this world. Amid lacy layers of hemlock and vine maple, mixed stands of spruce and cedar stretch to the sky. But the mighty Douglas fir towers over everything reaching heights of more than 300 feet, taller than a 20-story building. It is one of the largest living things on Earth. Many Douglas firs live for 500 years. Some make it to a 1,000. Over the centuries, these giants show their age much as people do, becoming furrowed, craggy, and full of character. You crane your neck way back, to see the treetops. Who is living up in those branches? Hmm. Many animals make their homes in the soft moss and lichen that collect on the wide branches of the canopy. After a day of catching fish in the Pacific Ocean, marbled murrelets fly more than 30 miles to nest on these soft platforms. Among the branches, tiny rufous hummingbirds construct cups out of moss, needles, and spider webs to hold their eggs. Douglas squirrels, in search of ripe fir cones, also visit these lush aerial gardens perched more than 150 feet above the ground. Red tree voles may spend their entire lives up here, never touching the forest floor. When they are hungry, they eat Douglas fir needles. When they are thirsty, they lick the dew off wet branches. In the old growth world, Dead trees called snags are truly the life of the forest because they house many more creatures than live trees do. Pilot, piloted woodpeckers hollow out cavities, which are later taken over by families of bluebirds. Ball swifts construct nests inside hollow snags, attaching twigs to the walls with their gluey saliva. An osprey builds a big stick nest on the very top of a dying tree. There's the osprey. At twilight, these birds settle into their hollows and other creatures begin to stir. A flying squirrel peeks out of its den. A big brown bat, hidden under a loosening piece of bark, stretches out its soft leathery wings Soon these night creatures will be darting and gliding among the darkening trees.
Deep in the night, a flying squirrel parachutes down to the forest floor to dig for truffles, the fruit of a special fungus. A female spotted owl also leaves her nest at the top of a broken off tree. She is in search of food too and follows the squirrel down with silent wings and sharp talons. If she catches it, she will be able to take a meal home to the owlets waiting in her nest. On the forest floor, newly fallen snags become pathways for long-tailed weasels and tiny mice. Bark beetles chew under the bark, engraving delicate galleries where they deposit their eggs. Soon, longhorn beetles and golden buprestids move in, digging deeper tunnels and opening the log for more creatures to enter. As the beetles burrow, they leave behind fungal spores the seeds of a fungus, which they've carried in on their bodies. The fungus begins to branch out in fine threads that penetrate the wood. The slow recycling of the dead tree is underway. Sometimes snags fall across streams, slowing the current and creating quiet pools. The fallen logs sift and clean the water by trapping debris long enough for it to be broken down to aquatic insects. The insects in turn become food for coho salmon, which swim upstream from the ocean to spawn. Tailed frogs and Olympic salamanders forage in the gentle riffles, while dragonflies and long-tailed mayflies dart over the water's surface. A Pacific giant salamander, the largest salamander in the world, lays her eggs where the water can flow steadily over them. She will guard them for almost nine months until they hatch. The more a log decays, the more it splits and crumbles. Wide cracks extend along its length, creating openings like secret cave dwellings. Out of these dark caverns sprout colorful mushrooms, the fruit of the spreading fungi deep inside the log. Snail-eating beetles move quickly over the rough wood. A huge banana slug slides slowly under a honey mushroom, nibbling on the delicate gills. A Pacific tree frog hides in the moss atop the log, while a teeny shrew mole burrows into the soft wood below. Deep inside, thousands of termites dig a vast network of tiny passages. Millipedes and sow bugs probe their way through the tunnels dug by the termites. They chew up the log, leaving behind droppings that look like jigsaw puzzles made up of tiny wood chips. Fungi feed on the wood too, their slender threads reaching everywhere. In dark crevices, pseudoscorpions build silken nests and wait for unsuspecting beetles to wander past. Hundreds of thousands of even smaller creatures also move through the deep passages. Tiny mites and springtails devour the pellets left by the millipedes and sow bugs. Finally, billions of microscopic bacteria break the wood down into finer and finer bits. After 500 years, a fallen snag is nothing more than a soft mound of earth. All the grinding and tunneling have turned the wood into powdery, rich soil. Hemlock saplings and huckleberries sprout from this ground, providing food for Roosevelt elk in winter. But a Douglas fir cannot grow in this sheltered world. In order for it to sprout, 
a dramatic event must occur, one that happens only once every 250 to 400 years. Hmm. It usually happens in summer when a thunderstorm builds overhead. Suddenly, lightning strikes a towering Douglas fir, and a hot bead of fire travels down the trunk, igniting the dry underbrush. With winds fanning the flames, the wildfire rages quickly through the forest. Some trees survive the intense heat, others do not. But the death of these trees brings new life to the forest because it allows sunlight to reach the soil again and a Douglas fir must have sunlight in order to sprout. A few months after the fire, cooling rains begin. The winged seeds of the surviving Douglas firs break loose from their cones and spin down to the ground. As deer mice and towns of chipmunks explore the charred forest looking for seeds to eat, they leave behind droppings full of the live spores of their favorite food, the truffle. With these droppings, the mice and chipmunks unknowingly help prepare the soil for new trees. A Douglas fir seed lands next to a fallen tree and escapes the notice of the busy animals. The following spring, it swells and splits open in the warm, rich soil. The seedling's tiny roots reach out and burrow into a mouse dropping, finding thousands of truffle spores. The fungus that grows from these spores forms a coating around the root tips, protecting them from disease and bringing to the seedling nutrients from the soil. At the same time, the seedling begins to send sugar to the fungus, making it grow faster. Every Douglas fir seedling, if it is to survive, must form a partnership with this special fungus. In the sunlit clearing, surrounded and protected by its elders, the tiny Douglas fir becomes a sapling. Over the centuries, it will grow straight and tall then scarred and deeply furrowed, finally weakened by insects and toppled by wind or fire, it will sink slowly back into the soil to nourish the future. You see the sapling? Okay, get ready for your stop and job. Go to your schedule, look at your assignment, and stop and job. That's all for now. Bye.